You're listening to the Future Tech Health Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Until I reached the age of 40, I never realized the obvious, that we all have medical issues, or we at least have a family member or close relation that had, has, or will have them in the future. Medicine and biological systems are the final frontier. Until we've conquered death, figured out how life began, cured cancer, and understood our purpose in the universe, there's a heck of a lot to talk about when it comes to our health. Future Tech Health means I'll be covering futuristic topics that are actually already in clinical trials or even starting to appear on shelves or by prescription or available for your own use. We dive deep into stem cells, CRISPR-Cas9, the science of sleep, epigenetics, medical testing, cancer, ketogenic diets, stem cells, aging, regenerative medicine, and more. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a serious medical problem. Remember, however, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you enjoy the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and share it with friends. Thank you. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Future Tech and Future Tech Health podcast. I have uh, Dr. Raja Silamani. Uh, he's an associate professor of clinical dermatology at University of uh, California, Davis. The board certified dermatologist and also practices at the Pacific Skin Institute and also an adjunct uh, associate professor of clinical dermatology, UC Davis, and director of clinical research and clinical trials unit. So, uh, Dr. Silamani, thank you for coming. How are you doing? Oh, I'm doing great, Richard. Uh, it's it's fun to be here with you. Yeah, tell me why. Uh, what what attracted you to the world of uh, of dermatology years ago? <laughs> you know, uh, one of the things that really drew me in. Uh, I've I've always had this mind to think about the world from both. Uh, uh, I, I love the humanistic part of medicine, but I also love the technical part of medicine, engineer cardiology, where they do a lot of engineering, and you know, there's a lot of mechanical mechanics involved. But something about dermatology really drew me in, just the mechanics of skin, the engineering of skin. But then there's this whole psychological component because it's pretty much a social organ. I mean, people say it's the biggest organ, but I, I like to look at it as it's, it's, the, it's the one social organ that we have on our entire body. And so there's sure. this humanistic quality that I feel like really drew me into dermatology. Every single derm condition a lot of them are visible. So then it has a social impact, a psychological impact, and a medical impact. And I thought, wow, tie that all together. And also looking at the the possibility of doing some cool tech things with the skin, uh, it was a no-brainer for me. I just uh, drew me in. And I will say I had a mentor who was amazingly influential to me, Howard Maybach. And he was just a very innovative right. guy, uh, the way he could talk to his patients and, and the way he would uh, combine research with uh, medicine. So that also yeah. was another uh, compelling and I would say inspiring uh, part of my past. Okay. And what's the focus of your research and your clinical work now? You know, now I, I take a couple angles when I do my research. And one of them is really focused on bridging uh, Western medicine to alternative and traditional medicines. I'm also an Ayurvedic practitioner outside of uh, the, the classic Western trained dermatology path that I took. And I like to bridge in a lot of the knowledge that we uh, are, have from traditional medicines that look at things like uh, nutrition and diet. And so I look at the gut skin access, meaning how does the gut microbiome and you know the bacteria that make up our gut, how does that communicate and how is that changed by things that we might take in as supplements or as uh, foods uh, or as uh, herbs? And how does that connect to the rest of the body? And in particular, how does that influence the skin? with my goal being that if we can find ways that we can eat better or be healthier in a holistic format and use skin as our motivator, maybe that can make us healthy generally uh, just by having better lifestyle approaches. So that's one of my areas of research. The other area that I'm really interested in is understanding how can we, how can we take imaging to the next level? And how can we do facial imaging? And can we tell things about people's faces? Can we track things on people's uh, faces in, in in our either you know be it a high quality clinical study or just in general are there things that you can get that are early bits of information from a photograph that might tell you something that your human eye might not pick up right off the bat? Well, I can see photographs, yeah, but I guess you know as I think about it, a lot of conditions can appear on the skin 
you know, moles and patterns of freckles or splotches or, you know, shading or rashes or all these things that uh, can indicate something going on on the inside. Like you know, I learned about people with diabetes may have acanthosis, nigricans, you know, darkening of the skin and skin tabs. And I guess the, the, the skin is the, like a billboard for a lot of what goes on internally in, a, in an organism. Yeah. You know, oh, Richard, that's such a great point. Uh, this, and in fact, your two examples uh, are uh, pinpoint right on. Acanthosis nigricans is something that we do see in younger folks, um, it especially shows up as what we call velvety hyperpigmented plaques. Basically, it's this thickening of the skin that looks kind of dark in the skin folds, in the neck, and uh, sometimes in the armpits. And it gives you a clue that maybe there's a bit more insulin resistance going on. And so, yeah, you're right. And uh, I mean, that's just one example. But the skin can end up being a canvas for something that might be going on inside. You know, also, which I think is really interesting, it's a canvas that tells on you, that tells the truth. So if you've had a lot of sun exposure, we can tell. If you've been picking on your skin uh, without even realizing or itching your skin, uh, there's clues for that too. So, and, And another really fun thing is that you can tell if people have certain habits. Um, for example, uh, if, if you tend to sleep on one side of your face more often or, you know, on one side of your body more often than the other, sometimes people can get these areas where they get their cartilage that inflames in their ear. And so you can even tell little things like, oh, you tend to sleep on your right side more often, or you tend to sleep on your left side more often. So you're right. It's a canvas for not only the inside, but just, you know, what are your daily habits and how do you do things on a day-to-day basis? Do you ever feel like Sherlock Holmes a little bit when you and you can tell something about someone that they don't tell you about? Yeah, you can. You know, in this new age of uh, cosmetics, sometimes, uh, you know, we talk about uh, botulinum toxin to help uh, get wrinkles and, and, and things like that. But sometimes when you see wrinkles, uh, you're right. You can kind of tell, have they, have they spent a lot of their life smiling or have they spent a lot of their life frowning? I mean, now, mm-hmm. you know, you can, you can sometimes mask that a little bit. Not totally. But uh, I do, uh, I guess I never thought of it as Sherlock Holmes, but I do uh, think of it as a, as a really cool way of getting to know people beyond just what you might, you know, get out of a conversation. You can get a lot just from, you know, people watching. It takes people watching to the next level in a way. Yeah. So, so what are you thinking with the face images that you use, what, like machine vision, AI, to look at the face and look at coloration and pigmentation and... Uh, uh, you know, maybe a time lapse of it or maybe an infrared of the face as well and be able to tell what's going on with that person. One of the most interesting and striking images that I saw when I was early in my medical school career was when they used to do these ultraviolet light um, photography. And hmm. what happens there is you can pick up on pigment spots on the face before the, the human eye can really discern it as well. And so they have these images of folks, you know, when they're relatively young, you know, in their maybe 20s, maybe early 30s. And, you know, they've had a lot of sun exposure. But, you know, at that age, it doesn't always show, especially if you have Caucasian skin, as an example. Sometimes age spots don't show right away. But then uh, you, you take their same image and you put it under a UV light, uh, especially like a black light setting. And you look at what their face looks like then, and all of these spots emerge all of a sudden. And now you're you're able to see all these spots that were signs of early damage that maybe you couldn't pick up in in just the standard lighting. And you show that to a patient, and they say, "Oh my God, I didn't even realize." And when people get a chance to see what their face is looking like before others can see it, um, or if they can see, like, what are the changes that are happening with the habits that I'm doing? Sometimes that is such a motivating factor for them to start uh, being really good about their sun protection or start wearing sunscreen when they're outdoors, or uh, just thinking about the fact that, oh, you know, my daily habits do matter. And how I Ooh. go about thinking about keeping my sun protect, I mean, skin protected it does make a difference. And so that's one small little area. Another thing that I think is really interesting is now you can have images where you can enhance certain colors. And one of the things that can happen when you are out night, you know, I talked about dark spots emerging with uh, sun exposure. Well, another thing that happens for a lot of people over time is that as they get more and more sun exposure, uh, again, and it shows up much more on Caucasian skin or light skin, you start getting redness on the skin because the collagen starts to thin and the vessels start to become much more visible. And so sometimes in photography, you can bring out the reds more brilliantly and you can start picking up on early areas of damage or 
signals that, hey, I'm getting a bit more sun or you're getting a bit more damage to your collagen than you might have realized. And there's a bit more redness to the face and these vessels are starting to show earlier. So the hope being maybe you can influence behavior and pattern by showing people how things are changing earlier than what you might not be able to see otherwise. Yeah, I was looking at a few pictures while you were talking and it looks like everyone has 8 million freckles under the UV light. (laughs) <laughs> yeah doesn't it you know it's it's yeah. amazing uh and a lot of people and it's it's a true thing you know when you do the uv light uv light uh you know we we tell people uv lights don't lie so uh you know there's definitely huh. there's definitely more um right at the surface than you realize so in um in clinical practice it sounds like every dermatologist should have you know a strong visible 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 light to look at a patch of skin that a person's complaining about but they should also look at it on infrared and they should also look at it on UV. Is that standard for dermatologists or is that not even used? It's uh, another excellent question, Richard. And in fact, yes, they do have other lights that we uh, utilize when we see patients. Now, as you mentioned, when we see a patient in a, in a consultation room, uh, especially in the patient exam room, the light, lighting is so important. And it's very, very important because that's how you can pick up on the subtle colors. Because sometimes it's really important to see if uh, the skin has a bit of redness or if there's a little bit of pigment um, or if there's even other colors that are important. If there's a slight bit of green or slight bit of yellow, all of these are important. And what you'll find is when you go see your dermatologist, um, they'll absolutely have put a premium on having good lighting. And if if the lighting is not so great, they might whip out either an LED flashlight or even um, a, a dermatoscope, which is a magnifier that has a, a light built into it so they can take a really close look at things like your what we call nevi, your moles. But also just having good ambient light. But we do use something called a woods lamp. Now, a woods lamp is ultraviolet type A, and it's like a black light. And so what, what we'll do in certain skin conditions, if you're examining the face for you know, melasma or some sort of pigmentation unevenness, then we may cut the lights in the room and use the woods lamp, plug that in, and take a look. Or if people are concerned about losing a bit of so, um, where you can lose pigment so much more. So most dermatologists in their office are equipped, especially if they're doing a lot of medical dermatology, they are equipped with um, a woods lamp as part of their clinic. And so we don't just Mm -hmm. use regular ambient light. We definitely have UV light that's already in rooms or available that we can then use to better enhance uh, any changes in the skin. You know, for example, I'll give you an example where I had a case where I had to follow this uh, this one of the patients of mine that you know had had an injury, and um, right. you know after an injury, what can happen, especially if you have darker skin, is you can get post-inflammatory what we call hypopigmentation, where you can lose pigment in an area of your skin. And they had a large concern that, and they were relatively light skin, so you couldn't really tell that the pigment was missing. But they were concerned that, oh, am I going to have a higher sunburn risk in this area? And we were following it over time. But the key tool that we used was the woods lamp to be able to say, oh, look, your pigment is actually starting to even back out. and Now you're back to normal. And it was really um, not only essential for the visit, but it was essential in reassuring the patient that, look, your, your skin is coming back to normal. You know, always use good sun protection. But guess what? Your skin's recovered. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, there's nothing as reassuring as having the patient look down and seeing that lighting, you know, with, looking with you and seeing that, oh, look, the, my skin is starting to look even in that area again. Yeah, that's true. Huh. Very interesting. Um, all right. Well, so what um, in your in, in your face diagnosis system, are you trying to make a device that, again, incorporates like, you know, six or seven different types of lighting? Or what are you thinking that the system will look like and what will it be used for and how? Yeah, you know, what we're thinking right now, it's in the research setting, but um, what it helps you do is there are a a few companies out there right now that have enhanced photography, meaning it's not just uh, what we call white light photography or visible light photography. Some of the systems, and we've had systems too as part of our research setup, they'll take multiple photographs where they'll use a polarized light, uh, regular light, white light. They'll also use a blue light. And then they'll do um, triangulation where uh, they can actually map out every single spot on the face and then create a 3D model. And the reason that is really cool, and you know, it's like the technology of tomorrow that's here today. The thing that's really cool about that is when you're doing studies 
to look to see if, you know, maybe some new botanical or an, even just any new agent is going to be useful for fine lines or is it going to be useful for redness or is it going to be useful for pigment? One of the things that's really important is that you're beholden to the technology that you have. And sometimes we'll do clinical grading. And we'll say, oh, we want to see if there was a clinical change in something over time. Let's say like there's a, you know, a, some ingredient that you're testing and you want to see if it helps with fine lines. We as, as humans can only see gradations to a certain extent. But with these more advanced technologies, what you can do is you can start picking up on subtle changes. You have reproducible photographs. And some of these photography systems allow you to, um, when you take your first photograph, when the 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 participant come back and visit, say, a month later, they have an overlay in the photography machine mm. so that when they're getting their photograph taken, the software is telling you their face needs to line up in a certain way so that you can get almost an exact replica of the previous f- uh, photograph. Now, that's amazing because when you're doing some sort of analysis over time, the more reproducible your photographs and the more resolution you have on things like pigment or fine lines, the better you're going to be able to pick up on subtle changes earlier so that now we're able to find ingredients that might be truly having some sort of promise of a change that then we can push on to a greater clinical study. So you can do better sort of, um, I would say, screening of ingredients that might be promising. And then, of course, the ones that don't have any change, you you say, okay, this one doesn't have as much promise. So you don't have to spend one year or six months for your pilot study. You can just do it over two right. to three months and say, okay, here's a good candidate. Let's run with this one. And uh, it's it's in a clinical yeah, setting. It's not a petri dish. Yeah, I guess you'd project a series of registration marks, you know, overlay it on the image you want to take and the person steps in front of it and they make sure they line up and then you take the picture and you, you have a, a way of comparing the two pretty directly. Exactly. Yeah, it makes such a big difference instead of just hoping that they're in the same position. And, you know, they have these chin rests and forehead rests and uh, and it makes such a huge difference. So I, I feel like data, the way we collect data now is getting better and better. And who knows in the future, maybe we can use these same images to then put it through an artificial intelligence learning system to say where there are features of this particular person that allowed us to get a certain outcome that we didn't understand originally. Like were there certain er- early signs of pigment or early signs of certain levels of certain severity to their fine lines that would have predicted that, oh, this person's going to be a responder. So in the future, you can you can better pick those people for certain sort of treatments. I mean, that would be like what I would what I think is really exciting about what what's possible for tomorrow. I don't know if it's invasive, but I, I guess maybe for certain conditions, if the person agreed, you know, they might want to like strip down naked hold their arms out and their legs out and get the whole front and then turn around and get the whole back, you know, so you can see over their whole body what's going on with their skin if they have a condition that warrants that level of looking. Uh, I don't know if that exists or if that's even needed, but just the thought came to mind. Uh, they do have that. They have something called mole mapping where we can track all the moles on a person's body over time. Now, there's always some limits to the resolution of how good it is, and there's always limits yeah. to how closely they're able to track that. But you know, what the scenario that you just mentioned actually is not far-fetched at all. In fact, they have mole mapping cameras because some people are covered in moles, and then it becomes a challenge for even themselves as a, as a patient to follow each of these moles. And it, it can be a source of a lot of anxiety, especially if you've got a family history of melanoma or you yourself have had melanoma and you have all these moles. You know, you're starting to look at each little mole and you're saying, God, which one is out of, you know, out of uh, mm. the normal growth patterns? Sometimes that's hard. And so they do have these mole mapping devices. Uh, I think that they're not in regular use yet because... Uh, it takes a little bit of, I would say, uh, time to do those kind of imaging, and it's not always practical, right. but there are research centers that do them. I mean, one place uh, that's been really working on this, and I have to commend her on her work, is, uh, is uh, Dr. Susan Sweater. She's uh, at Stanford, and they've been doing a lot of work with mole mapping. I mean, there's multiple investigators. It's just I've seen some of the work that she's done, and it's been she's really tried to advance the field in terms of figuring out how can we do this well. Okay. What about um, instead of just pictures, taking a video of someone's face and have them, you know, say a sentence or make different expressions? Would there be would there be any value in that and seeing how the the skin reacts and how landmarks on the skin move, freckles move or don't move? Absolutely, I'm so happy you brought up video. 
one of the things that you lose in photography, if it's truly static photography, is you don't get the motion. And I think the motion can tell you a lot about the state of collagen, what kind of blood flow is going on. Both of those, I think, are really important. We don't have a good way of incorporating that into any of the technologies right now, um, because I think a lot of people are focused on static images. But, you know, with the advent of these new kind of cameras, whether it's an iPhone or an Android, sometimes they have this uh, photography that gives you a little bit of motion. It, it actually is like a mini video uh -huh. when they take these yep. photographs. And it turns out when you do that, you might be able to pick up on subtle changes in uh, blood flow, or you could pick up on how maybe a certain part of the face moves or a wrinkle moves. And that might give you more information about is there early photo aging that's starting to occur or are there early signs of damage that are starting to show and i think that uh the research needs to move in that direction to look at these mini videos so that you get mini snapshots of someone but i think video absolutely gives you more information than just a static photograph and i think that uh i think there's a lot of promise there i don't think we've figured it out exactly how we're going to use it but I sure hope people are trying to do something with that because um, I'm sure a lot of people wouldn't mind uploading a mini video if it's going to help them understand how their face is changing over time. Yeah. Well, it's funny. I was remembering a video on YouTube. This guy took a picture of himself every day for like 11 years. And then they play yeah. this kind of haunt, haunting music in the background. You see his face change and his hair and you see his hair recede. Like, I bet you would love that video. I don't know if you saw it or not. No, I have. I, I, I really get a kick out of that video. To me, I'm always fascinated when I see folks when they're young and they post these pictures of uh, as they get older. There's something there's something about that that's so touching from a humanistic perspective to embrace mm. the fact that we are going to age. You know, I, there's always two sides to me. I mean, I do a lot of cosmetics. Uh, you know, we do botulinum toxin injections. I do fillers. I, we've done facial lasers. So, you know, we try to help people feel the best that they can uh, so that they can present themselves in a very confident manner. But there's also that part of me that looks at aging and really appreciates it. And maybe that's the Ayurvedic part of me, but really appreciates every phase of life. And there's something about it that's just so touching to see someone age with time. And, uh, right. and, and, it, and it gives you clues. Like, did they smoke? Did they try to take care of their skin? Um, did they put on weight? Uh, it, was there some sort of injury that occurred along the way? You know, it's a, there's so many little humanistic things that come out of those videos. So I absolutely love that video. I know which one you're talking about. Okay. okay. Well, um, switching to the other topic a little bit, you talked about the microbiome. And you talk about the gut microbiome, but from what I've heard, there are multiple skin microbiomes. There's unique ones on, like under each armpit is different. And on, you know, this part of your body, there's certain microbes and another part of your body, there's other ones. So I don't know how much have you looked at this, and do the you know do the various skin microbiomes communicate with each other? Do they communicate internally to the gut? I mean, what's some of the work you've done in the microbiome area? What have you learned that's like surprising or interesting? What an interesting, interesting area. This has just been a, a total paradigm shift in how we think about the human body. So, so yes, to answer your question more directly, we do work on the skin microbiome. Um, we do work on the gut microbiome too, but to, just to speak about the skin, I think the skin microbiome is absolutely fascinating. I mean, when you look at how we are patterned by not only the bacteria, but the fungi that live on us, and uh, believe it or not, we have commensal, I hate to say parasites, but we do have commensal organisms that live on us. There are some mites that live on many of our um, faces called Demodex. So there's this really rich microbial community that is just patterned all over. So on your face, you have more natural oils on your face. So there's certain type of bacteria that tend to be favored in those locations. Like you said, the moist areas under the armpit, uh, you get a different population. In the dry parts of your skin, you get a different um, you get a different set of bacteria. And sometimes, you know, in between your feet and toes, as we know, there can be an extra bit oh, yeah. of growth of either fungi or other bacteria. Uh, so that is, and not only that, it goes one level above that. For example, if you look at the face, you have bacteria that live on the surface, but then you also have pores that are filled with our natural uh, sebum, which is the oil that our uh, oil glands, which are known as sebaceous glands, produce. And so within the hair follicle, you will have a much more lipid rich, oil rich uh, environment. And so the bacteria, even taking the surface and then going down the hair follicle is going to be patterned differently. 
And so you just have hmm. this, what I call dynamic microbiome that's just constantly shifting as you're moving from one landscape to the next. It's, it's truly like going on a hike and you know, you see one group of plants and as you move into a different environment, you might see if it's more shady in some areas, then you'll find different sorts of plants growing there. It's the same sort of a thing. And the way to communicate is so important. And I think one small example of this is when people, and they've done some studies on this, when people have, and this is what, just, just one example, when people have eczema, they've shown that when their eczema, also known as atopic dermatitis, when their eczema flares, there is a loss of bacteria by just one bacteria, and, and it turns out in the studies that show that was uh, Staphylococcus aureus. You have this domination of one bacteria, so what happens is this: they, there's this diversity indices that they look at. The diversity goes down, and then huh. as you start to control that inflammation and get the skin back more towards a state of uh, quiescence and uh, equilibrium, that diversity then starts to increase again. You don't have one dominating bacteria necessarily, and you know, this is just an eczema. Mm. They've shown that as you flare, you actually see a shift in the bacteria before the flare occurs. It becomes a chicken or the egg, though. Oh. There's no proof that right now that it's the bacteria shifting that caused the flare. But what it does tell you is that was there a micro flare that was starting to occur and somehow d did that influence the bacteria? Did it go vice versa? But it's really interesting. And then as you re as your uh, skin inflammation resolves in eczema, the, the bacteria then also resolves to then have a more diverse population. Super interesting, uh, I think. And so now we're trying to, I think, look at are there ways that we can control that? Are there ways that we can make sure that our bacteria doesn't get um, doesn't lose its diversity? Are there things that you can put into moisturizers on a daily basis, be it an herb or an ingredient or other probiotics that can keep it in a healthier state? I think that's uh, the state of where we're going with some of the new technology within the microbiome and probiotic space. Yeah, I bet you that the uh, you see the flare because of the quorum sensing of the bacteria. They're probably amassing, you know, a certain kind that's going to cause eczema. Let's say they're amassing and they don't turn on and attack and flare up until they get to a certain critical mass. And then they do, you know, they communicate and then all of a sudden, poof, but you can spot that earlier on. And I bet you that's why. But it's just my speculation. Yeah, if there's a way to spot that. And then with quorum sensing comes this whole notion of biofilms. And we do know that biofilms uh, occur naturally on the body. Uh, to, to your question directly, they haven't, they haven't looked at quorum sensing specifically with, ex, uh, with eczema yet. But it is something that um, we all know because we, we do some microbiology research, too. And I just want to call out one of my um, esteemed colleagues, Dr. Robert Crawford at Sacramento State University. He has a microbiology lab and we collaborate a lot and he does a lot of work on biofilms. And yeah. when bacteria have quorum sensing and they become a biofilm, they become a whole different entity. It's, uh, it's, they, they become much more difficult to eradicate, much more resistant to antibiotics. And so, but we're covered in biofilms. We have biofilms in our mouth, biofilms uh, in our, you know, so then they show up on our toothbrushes, biofilm in our gut, biofilm on our skin. Mm. And some biofilms you probably embrace and say, hey, it's healthy. But um, for the most part, we're still starting to understand what biofilms do. But, uh, you know, the whole quorum sensing point is, uh, it's an interesting one. We should uh, definitely look more into that area of research. Yeah, and I was wondering what, um, well, uh, I guess, uh, let me see. So I was going to ask you first, what happens then if you put on makeup, for instance? What does that do to the microbiome of your lips and your cheeks and all that if you wear foundation and eyeshadow and lipstick and all that? And then uh, I had another question after that, but that one first. Has anyone studied that, what it does? This is probably one of those holy grail questions, which is trying to understand two main concepts. When you use your personal care products, are you disrupting your natural microbiome? That's something that a lot, a lot of companies are now becoming cognizant about. Because the last thing you want to do is mess up the natural balance and then somehow make you more susceptible to either inflammation or some sort of micro invasion of the what we call the bad guy bacteria that might cause, you know, potential for infection or just making your skin more irritated. But then on the flip side, there's also the other part of it, which is can you deliver certain nutrients or certain bacteria that might take up residence and make your skin even more healthy? And that is a that is a much more challenging question to answer because then you need to you know pick bacteria that might be able to actually then take up residence and, and graft. And it turns out that's actually pretty challenging. The bacteria that already are on your skin, they are in there pretty well rooted in one way, shape, or form. 
And so bringing in a new organism sometimes can be a challenge. But, you know, sometimes what you do is you you find the same sort of bacteria that are already on your skin and just alter some of its functionality so that's not as inflammatory and try to see if you can replace your native bacteria that might be inflammatory with uh, bacteria that are of the same species, but maybe less inflammatory. You know, this is kind of the future. We're not there yet, but this is kind of the future of what we're thinking we might be able to do with the microbiome. A lot of companies, and I do, I do, I do research with a few of them. Um, a lot of companies are interested in whether the ingredients or their whole products are disrupting the microbiome, or if they're able to keep it from uh, getting out of balance. So that's that. That is an area of ongoing work and ongoing interest, even from a product perspective. Yeah, I mean, why not try to include prebiotics to feed the beneficial ones and probiotics to seed it along with you know if you make a lipstick that has the right prebiotics to give the right bacteria, you know, to appear on your lips. Why not do that instead of uh, chemicals that may disrupt them? You know, maybe that that would be, I guess, the end of the thinking, but it should continue all the way through that. Yes. In fact, they have a name for it. It's called symbiotics, where you can give both the prebiotic with the uh, probiotic. And maybe if it's okay, maybe it's worth me just explaining the difference between a probiotic, a prebiotic, and a postbiotic. Um, if, uh, sure. if, so a prebiotic is um, anything that, and it's classically sugars that promote the growth of bacteria and ideally promote the growth of the beneficial bacteria. So things like fermented foods, fermented foods have fermentation byproducts that are supposed to be beneficial and promote the growth of beneficial bacteria in the gut. Um, so that's one thing. And uh, the second thing is, uh, the second concept is of probiotics and probiotics are the actual bacteria and probiotics can come in two forms. Either they can be live probiotics or they can be dead probiotics. And a lot of people used to wonder, well, if you are a dead bacteria, are you going to do anything? It turns out actually, yes, you can still have a function, even if you're a, a probiotic that isn't live. Live probiotic have the metabolic processes of that natural bacteria that are still active. But it turns out the surface of bacteria are covered in proteins that can still interact with other bacteria that are in the vicinity. So if you take an oral probiotic that's um, dead, meaning it's, you know, they're not composed of live bacteria, or you put one on your skin, there's still the potential that you can have surface to surface interactions that can temporarily change function of the live bacteria that are still there. So, um, so, you know, there's, there's some nuance to being a probiotic, but by and large, the concept of probiotics is that you're delivering a bacteria. Then you have postbiotics. Postbiotics are really interesting because it's where you take a bacteria and you grow it, and then you, uh, you get all these metabolic byproducts that that bacteria is secreting, and then what you do is you collect all those secretions, and then you use that as the therapeutic. And the cool thing about that is um, you don't have to worry about whether the bacteria is alive or not because they're all metabolic byproducts. And the idea there is that beneficial bacteria are creating an environment around them that continues to be beneficial. Well, why don't we take that environment and somehow package that as a postbiotic and then deliver that to the skin? And so uh, companies are now getting clever where they're putting in mixtures of prebiotics with probiotics and also postbiotics. And what we find is that some of these uh, postbiotics can actually have pretty interesting effects and can, uh, can shift metabolic processes of either human cells or other bacterial cells. So that's some of the work that we actually are doing. We, are, uh, we have a manuscript right now that's under review where we compared a prebiotic, postbiotic, and a probiotic, and just to see you know, how do those different approaches affect the skin differently, or skin cells differently. Has anyone profiled, you know, some of the species that appear on your skin because it's pretty accessible. You know, people always want to look at the gut microbiome and they complain, oh, they're hard to get to and there's a whole roiling and mass of other creatures there. But on the skin, it's easy to get to. Has anyone looked at, you know, a certain skin bug and said, what's it, what is it eating? What are its metabolites? You know, what is it excreting? Like, why is it there on this part of the skin and what is it getting and eating and doing? And, you know, what, how does it live? And then maybe you'd be able to uh, influence it better that way. Yes, they absolutely have. They've started profiling, especially the surface bacteria. Now, it turns out how you do the collections does matter. But uh, to generally speak, they have profiled the bacteria. It turns out your skin has a lot of what's known as staphylococcus. And usually it's a species uh, that's known as staphylococcus epidermidis. Um, you can also have uh, Propioni bacterium acnes. That tends to be found in actually not just people that have acne, but you can find it in people that don't have acne too. It, actually, it's very common. 
and those those bacteria so those are two then you can also have coriny bacteria which is another species and also depends where you do the sampling from as we alluded to earlier so if you do it in areas that are rich with oils that tends to be like your face your upper chest upper back your neck there you'll get more of the propioni bacteria acnes which i should uh, i should uh, clarify that actually the name has changed now to QD bacteria a lot of people used to call it p acnes now the name has actually been changed to c acnes mm. But more of the C acnes on, on the skin in the what we call lipophilic areas. But when you get into the, the regions that tend to have more moisture, like the armpits or if it's down into the toes, you can get other bacteria like coriny bacteria. And uh, Staphylococcus epidermis, like that I mentioned, tends to be kind of all over, but tends to show itself much more in areas maybe that aren't dominated in areas of moisture. And so um, there are a couple manuscripts that have done this profiling. And it's not just bacteria. They've also profiled the different kinds of fungi that show up. And uh, the, so, so the, it's something that they look at closely. So there has been profiling done. But as I mentioned, now the new thing is to realize that you also have bacteria that are inside the hair follicles. And so how you collect yeah. the hair follicle and then get the base of that also does shift the kind of bacteria that are present too. And uh, so there's more to be done than just what uh, comes at the surface. So I guess the microbiome of the skin is more than uh, more than skin deep, I suppose, in a way. Well, it's still in the skin, but there's there's definitely a topography yeah. to that to that microbiome. Hmm. Yeah, there's so much to it; it's crazy. Like, um, oh my god, it's yeah, uh, it's so interesting. I think it's fascinating. <laughs> you know what? It's so fun to think about these things. There's so much uh, involved in there. Yeah, have, have, I mean, like your left armpit versus your right armpit. Are the bacterial colonies different because? You know, I, maybe one armpit smells more than the other, which tells me maybe that uh, there's different stuff under each. I don't know. Have we looked at that, for instance? Yeah, and, uh, by and large, uh, so far what I've seen is that the, the collectively they'll just look at the armpits and it's not thought that they're different from each other. But uh, sure, if you use different products or different amount of products, you know, the bacteria are influenced by so many different things. They're also influenced by the kind of uh, personal care products that we're using. So, you know, if you're using certain personal care products in your armpit, for example, I mean, a simple example would be if you're using um, an antiperspirant, you're, you're probably not as moist in your, ar in your armpit. And so the kind of bacteria that grow there may be different than if you have uh, an antiperspirant on board or if you have a condition called hyperhidrosis where you're sweating quite a bit, your bacteria yeah. naturally are going to shift. But this whole right versus left, I haven't seen um, them look at that specifically. But uh, the armpits in general, they definitely are different than, you say, uh, you know, probably the crease behind your, your knees, for example. Yeah, that's what I mean, because they're so far apart on a person. I bet you it's like, uh, you know, you'd see two similar but uh, distinct sets of strains. It's like uh, isolated finches that live on two different islands, for instance. But anyway. <laughs> yeah, you know, they haven't noticed they haven't noticed that the armpits are different from me. That just speaks to the fact that we're always, you know, we're always uh, ha having a dynamic nature on our body. But uh, I haven't seen that the armpits are different from each other, but I have noticed that they're definitely different from other parts of the body. Yeah, well, like, what, what, just a few more questions on this. Like, what are the bacteria that is eating dead skin? Or they're eating, I mean, what are they eating? And then when they're excreting, is any of that beneficial for us? You know, is there a bacteria that lives on a certain part of us, eats the dead skin and, you know, for lack of a better word, poops out stuff that's beneficial to our skin in that area? I don't know. <laughs> you know, I know about that, but I guess the metabolic bacteria, you could look at it as bacterial poop. I suppose that's actually true. Oh, so that's a good point. <laughs> um, when you're looking at what they're eating, that definitely is the million dollar question, right? Because we want to know what gets a bacteria to become metabolically active in a good way versus becoming inflammatory. One, so a couple of things that we think the bacteria feed on. Uh, one is maybe they're byproducts that are being made by other bacteria that then support a particular bacteria. But also your mm. skin has natural oils to it. It has its natural oils that it makes. And so those lipids do serve as a source of lack, better term, lack of a better term, food for these bacteria. And then when you say eating dead skin cells, you know, they're not actively, you know, eating down into your skin. Um, however, we do know that when you get what are known as pathogenic bacteria, meaning bacteria that cause infection and uh, can really start to metabolize a lot of things, well, you do have those 
uh, I would say, ex exceptional cases where you have flesh eating bacteria and uh, the lot yeah. where they do start to really break down tissue and whatnot. But for the most part, the ones that are living on our skin, they do live off the lipids. Um, the dead layer of your skin is uh, rich in lipids. So sometimes some of the funguses that uh, fungi sorry, that grow on your skin, I don't think fungus is a word. So fungi that grow on your skin are uh, are also they're they're thriving because that of that lipid rich environment. And so that's why sometimes you get these super you know people talk about ringworm or ringworm infections. It's because the the fungi that and the the tinea, which is the infection tinea infections, they tend to favor that lipid rich environment at the very very surface of the skin. And so that's why you see them tend to be infectious in, in that location. Hmm. All right. Uh, any, uh, I guess, you know, last question or so, any, any things you learned about uh, the microbiome that just like amazes you? Oh, yes, absolutely. I think one of the things that I've come to realize is that the microbiome is up until now, a lot of what we talk about is what, what bacteria or what fungi are present and what we're doing in the microbiome. But it turns out that's, that's akin to knowing you know, say you go to a town, it's like knowing what the houses look like or what kind of people are living in those houses. But the next step that we want to go to is what are they doing? What is their actual functional, what is the functional of that things that it's producing that may be influencing not only locally, but maybe right around what we'd call slightly distant to that organ. So if it's the gut, for example, what are the things that it's producing that's getting into the systemic circulation that might influence our metabolism, might influence other metabolic processes? In the skin, um, you know, we might say there's particular bacteria that are present, but do we know what they're making? What is it that they're making as the next step? And so we're going to be going to uh, mapping, I believe, and it's going to move towards things like transcriptomics, and eventually we'll be able to predict this group of bacteria in this environment is not only, you know, present there's the species, but they're promoting and then hopefully in the future that'll help us better make interventions and therapeutics that can give us a functional outcome rather than just hoping to get the right bacteria there. We'll be able to now ask the question, what makes the bacteria right? And so I'm really mm. interested in go with microbiome research. Okay. Well very good. Well Raj, I know I've asked you eight million questions from all different angles, but to What's the best way for people to uh, either get in contact or see, you know, firsthand some of the things you're working on? Where should they go? Any websites or places or papers to look at? No, I appreciate you uh, allowing me to talk a little bit about that. One of the areas that we're really passionate about is education, and uh, we want to get information out there that's like. So we've got a website called LearnSkin.com, and some of the topics that we they're there. Uh, we have a continuing medical education series on the microbiome. We also put on summits. We have an upcoming summit, around, for example, around sun protection. We're going to have one on Ayurveda. We're going to have one on women's health. And so we try to build these topics uh, at learnskin.com so that people can come in, get high quality information. And we try to make it so that's really easy, accessible, easy to read. And then we also put on a symposium that's an in-person conference called the Integrative Dermatology Symposium. It's, uh, it's, it's a really exciting conference. We have multiple perspectives. Um, so we take Western medicine, obviously. I think that's super important, but we also bridge that with folks from uh, naturopathic medicine, traditional Chinese medicine, Irish And it's a great way to see other perspectives and, uh, and at the end of the day, broaden your own perspective and it'll help you connect with patients better and uh, think about uh, the body as a, a holistic approach rather than just you know, one disease. Excellent. Well, Roger, thank you for coming on the podcast. It's been super interesting. I appreciate it, Richard. Thank you for taking the time. You're listening to the Future Tech Health Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Until I reached age 40, I never realized the obvious, that we all have medical issues, or we at least have a family member or close relation that had, has, or will have them in the future. Medicine and biological systems are the final frontier. Until we've conquered death, figured out how life began, cured cancer, and understood our purpose in the universe, there's a heck of a lot to talk about when it comes to our health. Future Tech Health means I'll be covering futuristic topics that are actually already in clinical trials, or even starting to appear on shelves or by prescription, 
or available for your own use. We dive deep into stem cells, CRISPR-Cas9, the science of sleep, epigenetics, medical testing, cancer, ketogenic diets, stem cells, aging, regenerative medicine, and more. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a serious medical problem. Remember, however, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you enjoy the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and share it with friends. Thank you.